I said earlier, um, um, I'm the founder of the Life and Breath Foundation, and uh, the foundation was established in 1998 in memory of my mother, Ida Hull, who had pulmonary sarcoidosis. Uh, we weren't aware that she suffered with the disease. We didn't even know she had it and tragically passed away at age 59. So I engaged and went over to Johns Hopkins University here in Baltimore, uh, over to the hospital rather, uh, just to find out a little bit more about the disease, understanding that they've had a sarcoidosis clinic since 1961, developed by Dr. Carol Johns. Um, I spoke with Dr. David Muller and we formed a relationship and I knew I wanted to do something, not in my mother's memory, but try to help patients that possibly were suffering just like her, looking for information on how best to manage the disease. So the primary goals for the Life and Breath Foundation are to offer the sarcoidosis community effective tools to track their journey, decipher medical issues, and maximize their quality of life. So we really want a, a communication to occur within our uh, community. We want to make sure we're disseminating the appropriate and insightful and accurate information so there is no um, information. Uh, you are getting the top quality information. Also, we wanted to provide a nurturing environment for those affected by sarcoidosis so that they could share their experiences and help each other. Understanding that you're not by yourself, there's actually other people that are in the same or similar situation and uh, formulating an ally system. We all can do it and help each other through it. But we need that nurturing environment of people that will listen, people that will understand you're being challenged uh, by this disease in various uh, different ways. Um, but hopefully that would allow you to share your information, to be able to reach out, and for us to be able to build a bridge on how we can help you. And then the last of which was to build the awareness within the medical community itself to help combat this chronic disease. Another very important part, the primary care physicians, the primary, excuse me, the specialists that treat our patients across the United States, across the international gambit, are all in need of timely information that can help them diagnose, can help them treat, and can help them navigate patients to seek the appropriate care and as well as managing their appropriate care. What I wanted to do today is um, also indicate to you guys, in no way are we um, practicing medicine with any of the information that we share this evening. This is for informational uh, purposes only. We stress and uh, recommend you seeking counsel with your physician, with your doctor on any of the related information. Uh, but we're happy to help if you need it. The foundation is, is happy to do that. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm happy to uh, announce our guest speaker tonight is Dr. Megan Birkenstock. She's an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the Wilmer I Institute at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine here in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Dr. Birkenstock, what is, how do you pronounce that word? Uh, Uvitis? Um, yeah, uveitis. Uveitis. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Dr. Birkenstein is a uveitis specialist at the Wilmer Eye Institute, mm -hmm. which includes over 300 patients with sarcoidosis and eye involvement. Her research involves quality improvement initiatives and understanding the barriers to care in which patients, uh, to care in patients with this disease. So doctor, welcome. We're happy to have you. Um, uh, Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for having me and for spending time with me tonight to talk about something that I take care of on a daily basis and is near and dear to my heart. So um, I'm just going to briefly talk about sarcoid in the eye. I am open for questions. Please stop me at any point if you have some along the way. Um, just a few learning objectives for the night are just understanding how the development of ocular inflammation or uveitis and sarcoid are related. And also, when should you have your eyes examined if you have sarcoid, just to make sure that the eye does not become involved, even if it isn't at the beginning. So again, we're just going to talk what is uveitis, um, a little bit about the eye, and then how sarcoid affects each part of the eye. And then we'll talk about selected treatments for the things that can be affected. And then also when to see your friendly neighborhood uveitis specialist like myself. So uveitis is an umbrella term for intraocular inflammation. 
and it encompasses 60 different syndromes. And that ranges from things like infections, like we think of like with toxoplasmosis or some other um, like bacterial infections or autoimmune causes like sarcoid. And then rarely we also get patients with um, like lymphoma in the eye. It can affect one or both chambers of the eye. And that's why I'm going to show you eye anatomy in a second. And also we do treat other parts of the eye when they become inflamed, including the sclera, which is the white connective tissue layer on the outside of the eye, the orbit, which is our fancy term for eye socket. So anything that lives in the eye socket, the connective tissue there, the blood vessels, all the muscles that surround the eye to help your eye to move, and also the peripheral cornea. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. So here is um, our eyeball. Um, so up here in the front is the cornea that you can see it's clear. And that's where people get like LASIK or PRK or some of these other um, refractive surgeries that you hear about on TV. And behind it is the iris and it blue, green, brown, doesn't matter. It's a muscle that opens and closes. And then right in the middle of the iris is the pupil. And even though it looks like a black dot, it really is just an opening. So when light enters your eye, it passes through the cornea, through the pupil and hits the lens. Um, the lens turns into a cataract as we get older. Um, and then light should be focused back here onto the macula, which is the center of your vision. And it's part of the greater retina, which you see back here is an orange colored structure. But interestingly, on the outside of the eye, the cornea runs in here, which is the peripheral cornea into the sclera. And that's the dense white connective tissue layer that keeps the eyeball intact. And um, underneath it though, you see this little brown layer that's called the uvea. And so that's what we call the middle coat of the eye because the sandwich between the retina and the sclera. And when that becomes inflamed, as you see here, the, the iris is part of it. And then behind it, you might hear the term ciliary body. Um, and then behind that is what we call the choroid, which is um, a dense layer of blood vessels that gives nutrients to the overlying retina. And so if that becomes inflamed, sometimes the retina also becomes inflamed. And these guys also surround the optic nerve, which is the cable between the eye and the brain, which also can become um, inflamed as well. So there's two chambers to an eye. The front chamber starts at the cornea and ends back here around the lens. And that's called the anterior chamber because it's in the front. And then behind the lens back to the retina is called the posterior chamber. And it's filled with a gel called the vitreous gel. It's clear, it's just like a, a jelly ball. Um, and sometimes that also gets inflamed. So you'll hear the words intermediate uveitis because it's intermediate or in the middle part of the eye or also vitritis because it's the vitreous that's getting inflamed. And so that all encompasses the posterior pole or back of the eye. So inflammation in the eye um, normally doesn't happen in most people because it's an immune privilege site. So what do we mean by that? So usually the immune system leaves it alone, is not present within it. Um, other parts of the body where you don't want an immune system, because if inflammation happens, it would be disastrous, such as the brain or the central nervous system. Um, and so because of that, the eye lacks lymphatic drainage. So you think about lymph nodes in your body that carry away toxins and allow for, for clearing of debris. Well, the eye has none, except in the conjunctiva on the outside of the eye, which lays above the sclera. The cornea um, and also the lens inside the eye have no blood vessels whatsoever. So that way they're nice and clear and you can have light pass through them. Um, and then finally, proteins that lead to um, an inflammatory cell that somehow erroneously makes it into the eye um, are there on the cell surface in order to program them to die because they're not supposed to be there. So the eye has several layers of fail-proof safes that have to be violated in order for um, uveitis to occur. And one of the main culprits for this is sarcoid. And we all know that sarcoid does what it wants to to each organ system and the eye is no exception. In fact, we're one of the more commonly affected organs and it causes several different kinds of problems. The most common of which is called granulomatous uveitis. So it's inflammation, just like in the lungs when you hear about granulomas or areas of white cells sticking together to make like little clumps in each organ, so too it does in the eye. But the beauty of the eye is you can see into it. And so I'm going to show you pictures of granulomas in a live eye in a second. It can also lead to an inflammatory glaucoma. So when that side of the eye where the cornea met the sclera becomes inflamed, that's where the drainage canals inside your eye live. And so the eye makes fluid to bathe itself and give itself nutrients inside if it doesn't have blood vessels. 
And so if you make the fluid, you got to get rid of it. And so there's a drain 360 degrees on the outside of your eye. And if that becomes inflamed, say granulomas are there, you get an inflammatory glaucoma. The optic nerve can also become inflamed and granulomas can set up shop there as well. I have some great photos of that as well. And then even the white of the eye um, leading to scleritis can occur. Uh, one of the other more common features is dry eyes. Dry eyes and dry mouth, or what they call um, Shogun syndrome or Sika syndrome, um, can also occur um, in the setting of the lacrimal gland, which lives in the orbit or the eye socket, if that becomes involved with granulomas as well. So a lot of people end up with dry eyes. The granulomatous uveitis, um, you actually see the granulomas on the back of the cornea. And so since the cornea is clear, I have a lovely photo of it, but eventually both eyes ultimately become involved in sarcoidosis. And then when you look into the back of the eye, you'll notice that the veins specifically become in, uh, inflamed and it almost looks like candle wax dripping out of them because they become so leaky and so inflamed that all the proteins that we have in our blood just slowly leak out. And so when we look in as ophthalmologists, we see that directly and then we know you know, there's a phlebitis or inflammation of the veins. And that unfortunately to the eye signals the release of some inflammatory proteins that say, you know what, if I'm not getting my blood flow, maybe I need to grow new vessels. But the problem is new vessels grow where they shouldn't. And then that leads to other complications. So like I said, vitritis or inflammation in that, that gel ball in the back of the eye can happen. And small granulomas can even form and float around. And they literally look like snowballs. And I'll show you photos of that. And then they sediment down with gravity to the bottom of the eye and it forms a snow bank. And so it's just literally a layer of inflammation in the back of the eye. And finally, within the optic nerve itself, you can officially see a granuloma. Um, and also when you start seeing the optic nerve becomes involved because the eye is part of the central nervous system and we are attached to the brain, you have to automatically get an MRI of the brain just to make sure that you're not missing any further involvement in that organ. Okay, yeah. so, uh, there was a question came up pertaining to what you were just talking about. Is the inflammation granulomas in the eye called small angle glaucoma? So it's a great question. So glaucoma is, there's several kinds. And so there's a fundamental branch point. So when somebody says you have glaucoma, the first place where you diverge is either is the angle open, meaning are the drains open? Like when we look in with a special lens with mirrors, can we see the drains or is it closed up? And so closed angles or narrow angles happen when there's abnormal connections between the iris, which actually you see here in my photo here and the peripheral cornea. So a lot of that times that happens because granulomas are there or inflammatory proteins settle out there causing that abnormal connection and that closes the drain. So it's very common in addition to just inflammation to have a closed angle with sarcoid. Thank you. Oh yeah, absolutely. And stop me again, please. Um, so these are actual granulomas and they just sediment out here on the back of the cornea and you can see it's curved. And you can even see how robust the inflammation can be because here's the iris and you can see part of the iris is, is actually stuck down and almost being pulled apart on top of the lens, which should never happen. There should be a little gap between them, but here you see that they're attached and that's what we call synechiae, if your doctor ever says that, but this person has robust inflammation. And then these are the snowballs and I apologize it's blurry, but these are actually coming up at you. So they float freely in the back of the eye around. And some people will come in saying, oh, I have floaters or little black dots in my vision where really what they're seeing are the granulomas floating around in the back of their eye in the vitreous. These are the candle wax drippings I was talking about. So when you see veins, which are the thicker ones here in the back of the eye, all of a sudden you can tell where the inflammation of the vessel wall is occurring because literally the proteins are just seeping out and it looks like a candle dripping. This is a normal optic nerve in somebody who does not have glaucoma. Notice how it's pink and it almost looks like a glazed donut. It has a little donut hole and has a nice healthy rim and all the vessels seem to come out and emanate from it. You can see the difference in somebody with uh, involvement of sarcoid. This is a frank granuloma. And I'm telling you, the eye is the window to the soul, but it also gives you a bigger picture to what's going on in the body. So if we can see this in an optic nerve, I can only imagine what's going on in a liver or a lung. 
Um, but we just have the privilege of being able to see it. We're the only place in the body where you can actually see an artery. Um, and so here you see how the arteries are just twisted around it. And not only that, I have another patient. This is even more robust. This by far and away was, I think, the largest granuloma. When we looked at it, we were like, this has to be sarcoidin until almost proven otherwise. Obviously, we did a thorough workup, but we were highly concerned for sarcoid. I mean, it was elevated. This is an ultrasound of an eye. So here's the eyeball proper. And then here's the optic nerve going off into the brain. That granuloma was so large, you could actually see it coming out from the optic nerve proper. This is a picture of scleritis or the white of the eye, because here's the iris and the cornea here where it meets. This is a granuloma on top of the sclera on the con um, connective tissue above it. So here you see another example of where you can identify a granuloma directly in the eye. So how do we treat all this? Well, for the dry eyes, we usually start with artificial tears four times a day. And then if that doesn't work, you could also always put plugs in the lower lid. Um, and then a lot of times you'll hear other things like anti-inflammatory eye drops, just like you might take immunosuppressants like um, methotrexate or prednisone to help the rest of your body. We have local anti-inflammatory medications like cyclosporin, trade name Restasis, or Liftograss, trade name Zydra, in order to stop inflammation on the ocular surface and allow more tears to be produced. And in patients with really, really, really tough ocular inflammation leading to dry eyes, we even specially compound, meaning ask a pharmacy to make this special for us, um, tacrolimus or acyclosporin, other more potent um, forms of um, immunosuppressants or anti-inflammatory eye drops. Scleral lenses are our last line of defense. And so they're literally lenses that aren't just like contact lenses, which stick on your cornea but extend over the sclera. It's almost made like a, a moisture chamber on the surface of your eye that you take in and out every day in order to trap what tears you do make onto the surface. Scleritis, our first um, order of business is always oral non-steroidal inflammatory uh, agents. So ibuprofen or fluorbuprofen has been shown to be a little more friendly to the gastrointestinal tract. So we use those with mild forms of scleritis while also being mindful of the GI tract and giving people proton pump inhibitors or, you know, things like omeprazole, something to help protect from ulcer formation. And we also have to monitor your kidney function as well while you're on um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories because they're excreted in the urine and therefore pass through the kidney. Um, for the uveitis, if the inflammation is simply in the front of the eye, like where I showed you the mutton fat phreatic precipitates or the little granulomas in the cornea, we usually start with prednisone acetate or predforte is the trade name, and we'll slowly taper that over several weeks. In somebody where we need something a little bit stronger or you're having to take the predforte a little too often, that makes it hard to take through the day, we'll give you something called durazole or diflupredinate. And then we'll, we can transition back to Predforte once we get the inflammation under control, which is simply the hardest part of my job, getting in front of the eight ball and then being able to taper down to an, either an acceptable level or hopefully off of the ground. Sometimes if most of the inflammation's in the back, like in the example I used of snowballs or snow banks, we can actually put steroid pellets into your eye and then they slowly release from between either three to nine months for some of them, like the Ozerdex or the dexamethasone implant that you see over here on the left, or we have longer acting ones that last up to two years as well now. Um, there is one that you have to sew into the eye, so it requires a procedure, and that one lasts five years. But that one we don't use as much these days because these two, the one that lasts two years and the one that lasts three to nine months, um, can be done in the office with numbing your eye without a trip to the operating room. So it's a lot more patient-friendly. There's other things that you might hear us use. Um, if we don't use these pellets that we put in the eye, there is also something called Kenalog. It's similar to the story that people inject into people's joints, um, but we have a preservative free one that we put in the eye and it's like a slurry. So it's like a really dense um, grainy material when it goes into the eye and then it slowly disperses and it looks like a snow globe when you put it in and it dissolves over the course of about three to six months. And then finally, if the uveitis can't be controlled topically, or maybe the posterior chamber of the eye becomes involved, we have to use oral steroids and other immunosuppressants, such as methotrexate or um, Cellcept, or even sometimes um, Humira's Remicades um, that you might hear when you talk to your other specialists. 
And so we usually start at very high doses, one milligram per kilogram per day with up to 60 milligrams daily. Because again, getting control of the inflammation is the name of the game. The faster you gain control, the less side effects you have in the eye or adverse events like glaucoma, cataract formation, swelling in the retina or the macula specifically. And we try to taper patients down to 7.5 milligrams or less per day over the course of three months. And if we can't get to that point, then we need something else as an exit strategy to lower your steroids. And that's when we'll start using those other medications like methotrexate or mycophenolate. And uh, somebody asked about glaucoma, so I just threw this in. So glaucoma or elevated eye pressure can happen with the use of steroids. It can also happen with inflammation for the reasons we talked about. And so ordinarily you start with drops non-invasive. You take them several times a day. You might hear different names like bromonidine or alphagan, latanoprost, um, lumigan, uh, or zalatan, timolol, and then also dorzolamide. Um, and then ultimately about 10 to 20% of patients require surgeries. And there are different ones that can be performed. The ones I'm showing here are little bypass stents that one can inject here where the cornea meets the sclera. And that's where the drainage canal, which you can see here, is located inside the eye. So you can use a stent to keep it open and allow for the path of fluid to leave. Uh, the more traditional approach is what they call is creating a bleb or a trabeculectomy. So it's basically all plumbing at this point is rerouting the fluid from the inside to the outside. Because if you leave it inside, the pressure rises and that's when you have damage to the optic nerve, leading to vision loss, more peripheral vision loss at the beginning, closing into the center over time. And so the name of the game is reroute the plumbing. So whether it's a trabeculectomy where you make a little trap door in the sclera to allow fluid to leave and it goes underneath the conjunctiva making that little bubble or a bleb, or you simply put in, instead of a stent, you put in a tube that drains into a little plate on the outside of the eye. And then all the veins in the eye socket will pick up the fluid and then drain it out to um, the rest of the veins of the body. And so there's various and sundry ways to lower an eye pressure, but thank goodness it only happens in the minority of people. So when should you run into somebody like myself? Well, whenever you have the diagnosis of sarcoid, and believe me, we get a lot of patients who come in just with the diagnosis to rule out ocular involvement. And that means you have to have your eye pressure checked, your vision, and also a full dilated exam to look for all the things that we talked about earlier in the presentation on examination. Even if you don't have ocular involvement at the beginning of the diagnosis of sarcoid, over time it can develop, especially if you're changing therapies or you say you stop prednisone or go down on prednisone. Any of those times you could have breakthrough inflammation. And so if you ever develop a red or painful eye and you have a history of sarcoid, you need to come in right away. Because like I said, waiting and having uncontrolled inflammation leads to complications in the eye with the potential for long-term vision loss. And yearly dilated examinations, again, are required, even if no inflammation is seen, because if not else, it's still standard of care to get a yearly eye exam. And so that's all I really have, except I'd love to hear your questions. And there was one question that was very good. Thank you for that uh, presentation. It was wonderful. Um, there's one question um, mm -hmm. asked, is there any measures to prevent uveitis? Um, this uh, one guest has had uh, has had it numerous times over their 40 year journey with sarcoidosis, mm -hmm. and he recently diagnosed with uh, blepharitis. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, sure, blepharitis. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Any, any measures to prevent getting it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Sometimes it's just along for the ride if other organ systems are involved. And so early initiation of immunosuppression is really the way to keep the eye from becoming involved and using the, the medications that I listed today, methotrexate, mycophenolate. Um, and again, controlling the disease head to toe will be the only way to help protect the eye or stop the eye from becoming involved. And so aggressive medical care for the disease is really the only thing because if you have sarcoid, there's nothing stopping it from going to the eye because the eye can become inflamed. You know, we're attached to everybody else. So um, again, if you control the disease head to toe, then that's really the way to keep the eye in check. Awesome. Um, so the next question is, um, our, one of our guests has pan uveitis sure. and, and have developed macular 
and the vision, their vision has gone downhill fast. Is there, what's a procedure that can help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pan uveitis means the entire eye is inflamed, so all the way from the front, from the cornea, all the way back through the retina, um, and that that is tough. Um, so normally, what we do in that particular case is we start the prednisone at the one milligram per kilogram dose, so at 60 milligrams, try to taper down when we start an immunosuppressant, um, again, like the methotrexate or mycophenolate. Um, and if that doesn't work and somebody develops macular edema, because you can still get swelling in the retina or the macula, um, even when the eye is quiet and there's no signs of inflammation, it's, it's sometimes more resistant and it takes longer to go away even after you quiet the eye. So that's when we use injectable steroids in order to calm that and, and flatten the macula because just as they said, when the macula is swollen, then the eye can uh, focus light directly onto the retina to get a crisp image. And then that's when the vision starts to blur. So again, strict control of the disease with um, immunotherapy or suppressing medications to stop the inflammation in the eye and then using regional steroids like the injections in the eye to um, basically go to the heart of the problem and, and target the, the swelling. Awesome. Um, okay, well, thank you for that. Um, so one other question came in. Um, one of our guests has been on prednisone and hydrochloroquine for a year. Uh, mm -hmm. the question is, do you have any advice for side effects in the eye? Oh, sure. So I'm going to take each medication one at a time. So for prednisone, when you're on prednisone for a long time, it can cause a special cataract called a posterior subcapsular cataract. It is prototypical um, for steroid use. And so if you start to develop blurry vision over time, you need to have your eyes checked for cataracts. But the other thing that prednisone can do is also cause a uh, steroid induced glaucoma. So your pressure can also rise with just the use of prednisone alone. Um, but the hydroxychloroquine um, can affect the eye and it can um, lead to problems in the choroid that's supporting layer underneath the retina. And so only 7% of, or I'm sorry, 3% of people at seven years develop problems or talk, what they say toxicity um, where the area underneath uh, the retina um, starts to degenerate because of the medication building up in those cells. And so um, we advise yearly eye exams for anybody starting Plaquenil up until about seven, eight years of use. And then after that, every six months to make sure that if you are developing any kind of toxicity or the, those cells are starting to fail because of the long-term use of Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine, then that way we can stop the medication because unfortunately damage can still occur even after the medication stopped because those cells build up the medication with inside of them. Mm. Um, could you tell us what the effect of prednisone is on glaucoma? Sure. So um, one way that steroids affect the eye is by potentially causing either an increase in eye pressure or glaucoma proper. Nobody knows why it happens. And the type of prednisone or sorry, the type of corticosteroid that you use will affect the eye in a different way. If you use systemic prednisone, that's the type of steroid that's least likely to cause an elevation in eye pressure. If you use inhaled steroids in the nose, it's right by the eye. So you have a little bit higher of an incidence of the development of glaucoma. And if you start using eye drops or injections into the eye, those are the highest risk because you're putting it right into the structure that may ultimately develop the high pressures. Um, one thought, and again, nobody knows why this happens, is that the use of the steroids changes the way the cells in the drain around the outside of the eye is structured. And so it causes resistance. It's almost like putting hair in the drain. The less fluid can leave because of the effect of the steroid on those cells. And so the pressure slowly rises, rises, rises. Thank you for you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Um, so our, our next guest and question. Um, um, so this person has uveitis in the back of the eye and mm -hmm. has fought it for four years before macular de de degeneration and cataracts. Mm -hmm. um, they had an injection of three pellets, three times, sorry, injection of pellets three times. Uh, it seems like it's under control now for a year, but the question is, can it come back? Yes. 
um, unless the systemic disease is controlled or the eye disease is well controlled. The issue with uh, short acting steroids is that you need multiple injections, like what, what um, the guest had received. But the issue is they will eventually wear out like anything else in the world. And when they do, you have the ability for breakthrough inflammation. And that's what's scary to a uveitis specialist because we want you flat. We want you always controlled. We want you without inflammation. And while the steroids are very good at controlling inflammation and bring, down, bring it down rapidly, the problem is when they wear out, then you can flare. And then by the time we bring you back down, more damage could be done. And so you have to be wary of just local therapy, meaning injections in the eye is the only way to treat this because they're great as an adjunct, something to add on to your um, medications that you take by mouth, like um, the immunosuppressant drugs that I mentioned. But if you're only using that every once in a while, um, you have the potential for breakthrough. And yes, you always need to be monitored because if sarcoid likes one part of your body and it continuously attacks that, it's it's like an old dog. It doesn't learn new tricks and it usually tries to come back in the same place. Wow. Wow. Um, another uh, uveitis uh, uh, diagnosis. Um, so one of our guests has um, been diagnosed with uveitis for two years. Mm -hmm. um, after 22 years of dealing with sarcoid. Mm -hmm. um, currently, uh, she is on retesis drops. Retesis. Yeah, Repressa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Her vision is declined to 2040 with corrective lenses, and mm -hmm. she's told that this is the best vision that uh, that she can get, and it may get worse. Uh, currently, she's on methotrexic mm -hmm. X, uh, does injections, uh, mm -hmm. prednisone for two years, and Humira. She often yeah. sees blurry and double vision after reading. Is there anything... Uh, that can eliminate that. Yeah, so a lot of moving parts there. Um, yeah. So a 2040 vision, you need to, if somebody's not 2020, you always have to figure out why. So is there early cataracts? Is there macular edema, you know, swelling in the retina? Is there inflammation um, in the eye that's maybe smoldering, smoldering and subtle? When I hear double vision, I also want to make sure that the eye socket is not inflamed or that the person doesn't have dry eyes. Um, so there's a lot of other parts of the eye, I think, that really need to be vetted out, like we talked about, because they could easily become involved and give you those symptoms. Um, maybe 2040 is the best that you can see, but somebody can't say that unless they did like a thorough eye exam with dilation, making sure each part of the eye isn't inflamed, or there's not a way that we can maximize um, the potential for each part of the eye to see, such as if you had dry eye, really aggressively lubricate the eye or give you some rustasis to help you see better, especially when you're reading, because the eyes tend to dry out under, under that situation. And if the rest of your eye, or I'm sorry, the rest of your body is controlled with the Humira, the methotrexate, the prednisone, which is usual standard fare here for systemic control of the disease, but yet the eye is still inflamed, that's when you start to use eye drops, steroid eye drops or steroid implants, just again, as an adjunct. So there may be other ways to optimize your eye to help you see better, but all those things have to be evaluated for before somebody can say, well, this is the best we can do, unless there's something structurally wrong, but then they should tell you what that is in the, in the eye. Mm -hmm. um, can an optometrist check um, eyes during a regular visit? Sure, they can. Um, one of the things um, that, and, and I always find this whenever I go places, um, and I, I didn't know before I, I joined the, uh, the field, is um, optometry is a separate um, entity. So they go to optometry school for four years, and then they go into practice. Some of them choose to do an extra year um, of like a residency or an internship. Um, but ophthalmologists are actually MDs and we went to medical school. So we're well-versed about the rest of the body and including like sarcoid and other systemic diseases. And then we go through an intern year where we do general medicine. So we act as primary care providers for a year. And then we do three years of ophthalmology training. And if you're a uveitis specialist, you do yet another one or two years beyond that in order to just learn with, about inflammation in the eye. So um, it's just a difference in training, but what I feel as an ophthalmologist is that because I have a systemic mindset, because I was a general practitioner for a year, I'm more averse 
and dealing with all the subtleties of the rest of your disease. And so if you tell me you're starting to have a dry cough and you're not sure why, and I know that you got sarcoid, I know I'm going to order your chest CT for you and I'm going to pipe you in with sarcoid center. And so when, um, there's nothing wrong with having an optometrist do an eye exam. They're wonderful with eyes, but sometimes, um, especially if you have more complicated disease, um, it's good to see an ophthalmologist just because we just have a different mindset about the body in general, in addition to the eye. So that was another question that came in, just what mm -hmm. you said. Uh, you have somebody that has sarcoma mm -hmm. not in the eye, and uh, they've been getting eye exams by the optometrist, and they said, mm -hmm. should I come see you for their exam? So mm -hmm. thank you for, uh, for covering that one also. Mm -hmm. um, so our next question comes from someone that has pulmonary sarcoidosis and has never had issues with their eyes. Uh, they're considering LASIK surgery, okay. something that you would recommend for a sarcoidosis patient. It's a great question. And it's, it's a hot topic in the ophthalmology field. Um, whenever LASIK is a procedure um, to change the shape of your cornea, it should look like a basketball and be completely round and like a sphere in all directions. And in some folks, one side's longer than the other. So you have an astigmatism and, and that's normal. About 15% of the population has astigmatism, which could be corrected with glasses or contacts. Um, but sometimes we're also near, nearsighted or farsighted as well. And so by reshaping the cornea using a laser, they make a little like trapdoor flap and then change the shape of the cornea underneath it and put the flap back down almost like a little band-aid. So by changing the shape of the cornea, you change the way that light comes into the eye to eliminate the need for glasses or contacts and then helps make a crystal clear image. Um, when you have people with connective tissue disorders, and I think it's probably a little bit more relevant for folks with um, like lupus or ankylosing spondylitis, somebody who has B27 positive disease or other mixed connective tissue diseases, but sarcoid is no exception. Um, we're a little bit weary of doing um, LASIK because of the cornea being made of collagen, which is the same types that you'll find in your connective tissues. And so um, while there's no contraindication, meaning there's no hard stop, no, you shouldn't do it. It really requires a lot of counseling by the cornea surgeon, because that's who do it, cornea specialists or general ophthalmologist. Um, but it needs to be a discussion that there's always the risk of scarring. There's always the risk that it may not work as well for you, that your cornea may be too thin, or if you develop, um, there have been instances where people develop uveitis or inflammation in the front of the eye after the uh, LASIK. It's more in those other um, connective tissue diseases, not so much sarcoid. Um, but these are things that you really have to sit down with your doctor and talk about. Um, prior to it. And it may end up just fine for you. But like I said, it's, it's not a hard stop that we can't do it, but it's a, we really got to think about this one and we need to have a discussion. Well, that's, um, that is really, really good advice and um, very, very timely. Um, we've come, uh, unfortunately, we've come to uh, all the questions that have been asked and uh, you know, I would reach out to everybody else to see if there are any other questions that you would like to ask. Um, Dr. Birkenstock, is there anything um, that, that uh, you would like to cover that hasn't been covered? Anything that um, uh, our guests should be aware of that you feel is important? Things that you're seeing trend-wise with the people that, um, that you've seen this year or seen over the last 15 months? Sure. Um one, one additional thought to what I just said about um, LASIK is when we do a LASIK flap, we actually cut some of the corneal nerves to make that flap. And if you're already predisposed to having dry eyes and in sarcoid, we do, we have that predisposition, it can worsen your dry eye. So that's another discussion to have with your doctor. You know, I have dry eyes now, is this going to make it worse? And is it going to be intolerable for me if I'm barely hanging on and I'm using drops a lot or I'm already using plugs? Okay, because we get more dry as we get older, so more dryness. Um, but I just think that um, in the last year, it's been very difficult and um, for anybody with an autoimmune disorder with COVID. And it's been absolutely um, a very trying time for even the providers. And uh, 
we, we didn't lose any of our patients, thank goodness, to COVID, but we had a lot of patients considering whether they should stop their immunosuppression, should I get the immunization, and it's it's been a very tough year. So we are really just thankful to have our patients starting to come back and feel comfortable to come to our clinic for eye exams because it was, it was a bit disconcerting for several months to have somebody up in your face looking in your eye, you know, and... <clears throat> So um, we, we highly encourage people to start coming back and, and seeing us again for routine standard care. And we're happy to always accept new patients. There's actually six of us in our division. Um, there's about 200 uvi specialists in the United States, but there's six of us in our division. So we're massive, um, but that's Johns Hopkins for you. And um, so we, we cover our clinic every single day of the week. So if there's ever an emergency or somebody needs to be seen right away, I always tell people we're like Motel 6. We'll leave the light on for you. All you got to do is call. Well, this is spectacular. It, it seems like we, you, you, the one thing that I took away is you have to ask questions. You have to just continue, um, you know, advocating for yourself and seeking advice and, you know, and, and then more importantly, staying on top of it, right? Because it could come back. It's, it doesn't mean it's gone. And early, it seems like it's very, very important and something that you would want to do as a patient or as a, uh, as a supporter of a patient. Um, uh, Dr. Birkenstock, this mm -hmm. is wonderful. We've gotten a lot of um, kudos to the information that you shared from some of our um, uh, attendees, and we appreciate you taking the time. We know you're busy, but uh, to be able to uh, disseminate this information has been really good, and I'm very happy to be able to partner with you tonight uh, in doing that. So I just wanted to say thank you very much again uh, for your time. For those attending, um, the, the speaker series are something we do on a monthly basis. Uh, the next speaker series is July 8th, and it's going to be with Dr. Richard Harris, who's with the Great Health and Wellness uh, Center in Houston, Texas. He's going to be talking about supplements, um, and we, we hope that you'll be able to join us 7 p.m. July the 8th. Um, Thank you again for joining us tonight. And uh, I hope you have a very good evening, Dr. Birkenstock. Thank you for all you do for patients with sarcoidosis. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Good night. <laughs>